Thank you, dear Lord, for those who went out and outreach and you used for your glory. Many of us here have experienced this and though exhausted and tired after it, it was so abundantly worthwhile and we bless you for it. Thank you for the letter we've just written. We just take it and bring it up to you with praise and honor and glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. It's not we, but Christ in us who gets all the praise and all the glory. Now hear us. Lord, you know that we're feeling tired and for many of us it's been a busy day and we just trust you now for the last hour of this evening that you will give us refreshing and the sheer joy of being together and loving you and being loved by you and being bound up together in a bundle of life in the Lord our God. So help us all now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now then, for the last time today, would you just look at um, chapter 18 of John, please. Now we have just to look at the outline a bit outline a moment and uh, the last um, section we're in now, part C the revelation of God as love to all by the way I missed, you know, of course uh, those three chapters may I say to you that um, in relation to the ministry of the Holy Spirit if you want a book which has been a treasure store to me in my life. It would be Andrew Murray's book called The Spirit of Christ. I think that's a must for Christian people. Andrew Murray, The Spirit of Christ. Andrew Murray was the founder of what is now the Africa Evangelical Fellowship, went to the South Africa General Mission. And um, it's got 31 chapters, a chapter for every day of the month. You don't read the book at once. You just read a chapter at a time. And it's got different aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's simply tremendous. I do commend it to you. Andrew Murray, The Spirit of Christ. All right? Well, we had to miss out those chapters. This morning we dealt with chapter 17, the prayer of our Lord. Now, the revelation of God as love to all. We have uh, three lectures left including this evening and uh, we're going to look at uh, what I've called in the outline the trial, the tragedy and the triumph of divine love we're hoping to do the first two tonight then we'll look next week at the triumph of divine love and uh, finally at the epilogue in chapter 21 now the trial of divine love Love. Chapter 18. To save time, I won't read it now, but you'll have your Bible open before it, before you, and we'll refer to it uh, as we go along. First of all, in this chapter, we have the betrayal of Jesus. In the first 11 verses, the betrayal of Jesus. Verses 1 through 11. Some things are especially, I think, noteworthy. First of all, that this took place in Gethsemane, a place often frequented by the Lord and his disciples. It says that in the first two verses. There was a garden which he and disciples he and his disciples entered. Now, Jesus, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. When we started John's Gospel, I said that there was no Gethsemane in John. Well, there's only that reference to it. There's no reference to the prayer of agony that's recorded in the other three Gospels. I'll just give you one of them. Matthew 26 verse 36 
There's also a reference in Mark. And Luke, but if you get that one, that'll do. You remember the prayer I'm referring to when the Lord Jesus was praying and again the disciples presumably listening in and he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling on the ground. That prayer of agony, John doesn't refer to it. But notice that this was a place they often went to, familiar ground. And notice also that Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. Verse 4, Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And notice in the third place, will you, that um, three times Jesus said, I am he. You can ring those words round. You'll find them in verse 5, verse 6, and verse 8. He said that before. He said that before. And I'm sure Judas knew the meaning of his answer. Compare that I am he with chapter 4, verse 26. Don't bother to look it up, just shut it down. Chapter 4, verse 26. Hope I'm not going too quick. Stop me if I am. Chapter 6, verse 20, and chapter 8, verse 24. Jesus, all the time, I am he, I am he, I am he. And then notice also in these verses that Peter shows, as he often did, more courage than sense. Verse 10. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. There's not a bad shot. He meant to behead him, I'm sure. But he missed and just got his ear. Strange thing, he wasn't arrested. I presume that was because the Lord Jesus healed the man's ear. I can, only think, I can think of no other reason. And then, when Jesus said, I am he, you notice that in verse 6, Judas and the soldiers fell to the ground, overcome by the majesty of, of, of Christ. Verse 6. And Jesus repeats his question, who do you seek? And verse 7, he seem, gets the same reply. Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. So they may arrest him, but not the disciples. For said, they effect their escape, and scripture is fulfilled in verse 9. And then Jesus gives himself up. He gives himself up, surrenders himself. Just let me say slowly, and if you have the energy, strength left in one finger, just jot down this sentence, would you? The one passion of our Lord's life was the will of God. The question of the cup had been raised in fellowship with his father in prayer. The question of the cup had been raised in fellowship with his father in prayer. But always with the same restraint. Not my will, but yours be done. 
And so the moment of inquiry was over. Going too quick? You're exhausted. <laughs> so sorry. Um, repeat. The one concern of our Lord was the will of God. The question of this cup had been raised in fellowship with his father in prayer. But under the same reservation, not my will but thine. So the hour of inquiry was over. The cup had been given him to drink. <coughs> Therefore, no further questions. The cup had been given him to drink. Therefore, no further questions. That okay? Trouble? <laughs> Serious trouble? You want me to repeat? Who wants repetition? Oh, right, right, oh, come on then. <coughs> <laughs> get some grease on your hand and let's get going, right? And just repeating because it's important that we realize this because it's important personally too. The one concern in our Lord's life was the will of God. The question of the cup had been raised by him in fellowship with his father in prayer if there's any other way whereby people might be saved, Father, let it be that way. But not my will, but thine. If possible, let this cup depart from me. You'll see it all in Matthew in the portion I gave you. The cup had been given him to drink. Therefore, there was no further question. A question raised in prayer and settled in prayer could never be raised again. A question that was raised in prayer and settled in prayer could never be raised again in any other form or with anybody else. That's a tremendous thing to remember. When we've settled a question in prayer, never allow any discussion with anybody to raise that question again. And now we have... Um, after the betrayal, the first thing then is the Jewish trial. It would, the technical term would be the ecclesiastical trial, the religious trial, verses 12 through 27. Jesus is, in quotes, tried by the Jews. First before Annas, verse 13. And then before Caiaphas, verse 24. And part of this is peculiar to John. Only he mentions it. Let me just um, say this as interest. I don't think it's very important. But Annas happened to be the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And he had once been high priest himself. And he, then he was de deposed and put out of office by Caiaphas' father, his predecessor but he still sort of acted in the background preserved some background authority and so he is the first one to whom they take Jesus and you notice of these 16 verses verses 12 through 27 7 of them are not about the trial of Christ but the trial of Peter 7 of them deal with the trial of Peter verses 15 through 18 
and verses 25 to 27. They're about Peter. Just repeat that. Of these 16 verses, verses 12 through 27, seven of them are not about the trial of Jesus, but about the trial of Peter. That is, verses 15 to 18, verses 25 to 27. I haven't really time to go into those, but just let me say and put it down. Verse 17, verse 25, and verse 27. In each of those verses, Peter makes his denial of Christ. Verse 17, I am not. Are you also one of his disciples? I am not. Verse 25. I am not. Verse 27. Peter denied it again. And at once the cock crew. Those three verses, three denials of Christ in public, are the result of Chapter 13, verse 8. Never, says Peter. Never. Chapter 13, verse 8. And verse 37 of chapter 13. And also chapter 18, verse 10. And also Mark 8, verse 31. Those three denials which Peter made are the result of, in a word, his refusal of the principle of the cross. He thought the cross was a disaster and did everything he could to get Jesus out of it. We have to beware of Satan's traps like that. <clears throat> right? Now just look for a moment at this religious trial in verses 12 through 14 and 19 through 24. Jesus was led away by his captors not because he was helpless but because he was willing he was led away by his captors not because he was helpless but because he was willing it wasn't fetters that bound him but love it wasn't fetters but love. Notice in verse 19, they asked him about his doctrine, teaching, and his disciples. They didn't ask him in order that they might believe in him, but uh, to try to incriminate him, find him guilty. People's inquiries about Christ are not always honest of a subtle motive in verses 20 to 21 Jesus pointed out to them that his teaching was in public verses 20 through 21 I have spoken openly in the world I've always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together I have said nothing secretly why do you ask me ask those who have heard me what I said to them they know what I said in other words he hadn't been scheming behind closed doors 
he'd be preaching out in the open. John records a trial before Annas and uh, at night, and then before Cephas in the morning, verse 28. Both illegal. Wrong times. Verse 28. And you notice when questioned about uh, the nature of his teaching, Jesus claims that it's known to everybody. Verse 21. Ask those who heard me. And Jesus has slapped for insolence. But nobody can reject his answer. Verse 22. Verse 23. If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken right, why do you strike me? And then he is sent to Cephas. And then we have this, what I call the civil trial. First the ecclesiastical trial, the religious one, before the Jews, verses 12 through 27. And from verses 28 to chapter 19, verse 16. Got that? This is the civil trial before Rome. Verse 28 to 19, verse 16. This is, you can almost picture this, it's very interesting, uh, because the scene of it moves to and fro in relation to the uh, praetorium, the place of judgment, trial. And sometimes it's outside, sometimes inside. I'll just give you that. Now, you put down in your Bible, uh, in the margin or in your notes or something, put down this. Mark these movements. Got it? Outside, verses 28 to 32. I'm just quickly going to look at them all in a minute, but get them down first so we know where we are. Outside, verse 28 to 32. Inside, verses 33 to 38. Outside, verses 38 to 40. Inside, chapter 19, verses 1 to 3. Outside, verses 4 to 7. Inside, verses 8 to 11. Outside, verses 12 to 19. Got it? <laughs> I, I, I can sort of picture it in my mind out and in out and in all the time what a, what a, what a travesty the whole thing is but here you are I'll give it to you again because it's very interesting to picture these movements as they go out and in and Jesus is on trial outside verses 28 to 32 inside verses 33 to 38 outside verses 38 to 40 Inside, verses 19, ch chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. Outside, verses 4 to 7. Inside, verses 8 to 11. Outside, verses 12 to 19. Now, just look, just look at each of them very quickly, and you'll have a sentence, just a sentence, about each to put down your notes. First one, Pilate asking the Jews, what's the charge? Verses 28 to 32. They led Jesus from the house of Kiavas to the Praetorium. It was early. They themselves didn't enter, so they might not be defiled, but might eat the parcel. What religious hypocrisy. So Pilate went out to them, up to them, and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? It's absolutely clear that the Jew would have nothing less than a death sentence. Verse 30, 
And he answered him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. You said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. They were determined on a death sentence. And only the Roman authorities could, could impose that. But remember two things. And put down, just right now, right there in your notes, C, chapter 10, verses 17 through 18. I lay down my life. No man takes it from me. I lay it down and I take it again. This commandment I have received from my Father. Two things got to be seen there. Jesus was put to death by men, but he died voluntary. He was put to death by men, but he died voluntarily. Verses 28 to 32, that is. In the second se section, verses 33 to 38, which is uh, peculiar to John, only he records this, Pilate has a sort of private interview with Christ. Verses 33 to 38. Pilate entered the praetorium, inside now, again, and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or do other people say it to you about me? Jesus answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingship is not from this world. Pilate said to him, So you're a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? That is a tremendous, tremendous confrontation. Who do you think is king in that situation? Hmm. Jesus stood before Pilate. One day, Pilate will stand before him. Fancy God standing before a governor. Pilate asks his question, verse 33. And Jesus asks him, is that uh, your own thinking? Or is it somebody else's idea? Verse 34. After Pilate's scornful disclaimer... And his question, verse 35, Jesus points out the true nature of his kingdom. It's not of this world. Not established by earthly power, but it's a spiritual kingdom based on truth. And Pilate dismisses his claim with a sarcastic comment, what is truth? Truth's got to prevail, verse 37. And Christ, who's born, who was the truth, has borne witness to it. To this end, verse 37. For this I was born, and for this I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Oh, that's it. Do I know? Do you know? <clears throat> Why are you born? What are you born for? Human life is a plan of God. And each of us either frustrate it or fulfill it. It's a good thing to know why I came into the world and what I'm in the world for. God has a life plan for every one of us. And the great thrill will be one day to see that, that plan is fulfilled. Now the third section, verse 38 to 40, shows us what a mockery Pilate's justice is. Verse 38 to 40, got it? Pilate said, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no crime in him, but you have a custom. 
that I should release one man for you at the Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. I find in this man no fault, but, but, you have a custom. And the choice is between a robber and a redeemer. And nobody hesitates. There's many alternatives to Jesus, but every one of them is fatal. We can all have alternatives to the will of God, but every one is fatal. That's the third section. But it's absolutely clear he allowed all this, hoping it would satisfy the Jews and Jesus would escape. I'll just give you time to jot that down. The judge is becoming a criminal. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. Why did all this happen to Christ? Part of capital punishment, but no judgment had been given about it. Perfectly clear that Pilate allowed all of it hoping it would satisfy the Jews and Jesus would escape. Sure. What do you mean that? (laughs) The whole thing? (laughs) <laughs> All right. <clears throat> the judge fast becoming a criminal why was Jesus scourged why it's part of capital punishment but no formal judgment had been given on Christ and it's quite clear that Pilate allowed all this hoping it would satisfy the Jew and that Jesus might escape you'll find that very clearly uh, commented on in Luke's Gospel I'll just read it to you verse chapter 23 of Luke and verse 22 I think chapter 23 and verse 22 yes A third time he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no crime in him deserving death. I will therefore chastise him and release him. That's Pilate speaking. That's what he wanted to do. He knew it was right. Now, notice the fifth, inside the praetorium. uh, Rather, outside, before the crowd. This is four through seven of John 19. Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know I find no crime in him. Underline that he said that three times. Underline that. 1, chapter 18, verse 38. I find no crime in him. 2, and bring him out to you that you may know that I find no crime in him. 3, Verse 6, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. Three times over. One thing to do when you can find no crime in anybody, obviously, is to release him. Pronounce him not guilty. But you have a custom. Chapter 18, verse 39. The Jews say, we have a law. Verse 7. 
It's not just a custom, it's a law. By that law he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. In the name of custom, law, and anything you like, get rid of truth. That's what they were saying. Get truth out of the way. So, Peter, I mean uh, Pilate and Jesus, go inside again. Here's another private interview with him. Verses 8 to 11. In the first private interview, he talks about kingship. Chapter 18, verse 33 to 38. Kingship. Now, he talks about power. Chatters about power. Power. Pilate doesn't seem to have much power but he chatters about it in these verses verses 8 through 11 where are you from? Jesus gave no answer you won't speak to me do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered them you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above therefore he who delivered me to you has the greater sin And the seventh, the governor, who had an absolute contempt for the Jews, now taunts them. When Pilate heard these words, verse 13, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the pavement in the Hebrew gather. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? Chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he handed the, him over to them to be crucified. What a farce. What a farce. The trial. The trial of divine love. Now, just in a few moments, the tragedy of divine love. I don't know if that's quite the right word because in the end it was victory. But tragedy abused. And notice this, the crucifixion, verses 17 through 30. Verse 18, they had crucified him and with him two others, one in the, in the other si on either side and Jesus in the midst he's always in the midst the title on the cross the title on the cross Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews written in Hebrew Latin and Greek the languages of religion art and law Verse 20. And Pilate sort of um, became tough, but too late. Firm, but too late. Verse 22. They said, uh, Do not write the king of the Jews, but they said, he said, I'm the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I've written, I've written. It was the first time he was firm. Notice verse 22 here. Verse 22. John adds details regarding the dividing of Jesus' garments. Verse 23, sorry. And the soldiers had crucified Jesus. They took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. To fulfill the scripture, they parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That's not stated in any of the other Gospels, only in John. And the significance of it is an unrealized fulfillment 
of Psalm 22, verse 18. An unrealized fulfillment of Psalm 22, verse 18. You notice that Jesus had enemies and friends at the cross. Verses 23 to 27. He's never without both. But it's a tremendous contrast here. See the cruelty of his enemies, 23 and 24. And uh, the tenderness and love of his friends verses 25 through 27 I think it's to the credit eternal credit of these four women incidentally three of them called Mary they stood by him in this hour verse 25 but standing by the cross of Jesus were and then you have four women Verse 26 and 27 are very wonderful. Then he said to the disciple, uh, sorry, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. That's the third of the seven statements made on the cross. Let me just give you those seven. It might be helpful. And in order in which they were made, the seven sayings on Calvary. Here they are. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's in Luke 28, verse 34. That can't be right. Hold on. Luke 23, verse 34. Sorry. Yes. Verse, chapter 23 in Luke, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. And the second statement. Today, to the thief, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Luke 23, verse 43. And, uh, woman, behold your son. John 19, verse 26. Number four. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, verse 46. The fifth one, I thirst. John nineteen twenty eight. The sixth one, it is finished. John nineteen thirty. The seventh one, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Luke 23, 46. I'll just give you those references again so that you can look them up to be sure. Luke 23, 34. Luke 23, 43. John 19, verse 26. Matthew 27, verse 46. John 19, verse 28. John 19, 30. Luke 23 verse 46 those are the seven sayings on Calvary interesting too to trace 
the sentence in verse 26 the disciple whom Jesus loved who was that the author of this gospel the disciple whom Jesus loved and you'll find that statement five times five times in this gospel that's what Jesus what John called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved John 13 23 John 20 verse 2 and John 21 verses 7 and 20 gives you again five times the disciple whom Jesus loved John 13 23 John 20 verse 2 John 21 verse 20 and look at the work accomplished here in verse 28 to 30 after this Jesus knowing that all was now finished said I thirst a bowl full of vinegar stood there so he put a sponge full of vinegar on his hyssop hyssop, and held it to his mouth when Jesus had received the vinegar he said it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit it is finished finished And I have just one minute, two minutes to say just one other thing. Uh, By the way, just read John 4, 34 and John 17, verse 4. John 4, 34, John 17, 44. 17, 4, sorry. Finished. And the last sentence is the burial of Christ verses 31 to 42 and you notice in this section two requests verses 31 to 42 two requests first one verses 31 to 37 verse 31 to 47 the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken they might be taken away so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other the other thief who had been crucified with him but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead they did not break his legs that was fulfilling prophecy Exodus 12:46 a bone of him shall not be broken Exodus 12:46 Numbers 9:12 the legs of the thieves are broken but not the legs of Christ when we say as we often do at communion service this is my body which is broken for you that's not right his body wasn't broken it's the body he took from the cross right up to heaven that wasn't a broken body his body was given for me yes you say that that's right it was given but it wasn't broken And uh, the last request, lovely thing, in verses 38 to 42, we've already been uh, thinking about the devotion of these women. Here now are two devoted men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, both his disciples. They come to show their love. Jesus could have done with that before he was alive, better late than never. Joseph of Arimathea, disciple of the Jews, of Jesus, secretly for fear of the Jews. 
asked Pilate he might take her with the body and Pilate gave him leave so he took away his body Nicodemus also who had at first come to him by night came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes hundred pound weight they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloth with the spices as it is the burial custom of a Jew now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been laid so because the Jewish day of preparation as the tomb was close at hand they laid Jesus there there you can put Nicodemus story in just three little sentences short sentences three words his desire for Christ chapter 3 verses 1 to 11 his defense of Christ chapter 7 verses 45 to 52 and his devotion to Christ chapter 19 verse 39 you notice the progress here a cross a garden a tomb a body but Jesus is alive today and Jesus has suffered all that for you and for me right let's pray together <clears throat> Lord we tell you that we love you we don't understand why you should love us but we know you do and in return we love you <clears throat> and would seek to evidence that love in our submission to you and our walk with you now thank you for your help given to us bless us this evening and on the morrow if you tarry give us a great day we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.